Hey everybody, welcome. I'm gonna start the video, just hit right uh, We still have a few people uh, coming in. Um, let's see, I uh, just wanna make sure my audio is working. I had some issues a couple of weeks ago, uh, but I think I have them worked out. So if for some reason uh, you can't hear me, please let me know. And uh, I wanna make sure that I can, um, that we've, we've got this sorted out. But uh, I appreciate everyone uh, coming tonight. Um, for those of you who uh, enjoy uh, red wines, we're gonna have some fun. Um, let's see here, got some comments coming in. Uh, perfect. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Let's raise the glass to everyone. I hope you are uh, got your wines open. Cheers. I ain't got in here yet. Um, uh, I'm uh, Scott Jones of Jones is Thirsty. If this is your first time, uh, I see a lot of familiar names, but um, uh, I'm always sure there are some first timers. So uh, thank you for joining. Uh, pretty excited tonight. We're gonna be diving into the red wines of Argentina and Chile. And uh, if any of you have been around uh, Jones is Thirsty for any length of time, you know that I um, love both of those uh, countries and uh, particularly fond of, of Chile. Uh, but uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, um, or at least we're gonna try and scratch the surface of uh, both of those countries. Um, I sent out an email earlier, uh, a couple of hours ago, suggesting that you open your wines. All of the wines that we're gonna have tonight are young, youthful wines. So um, hopefully you were able to open them up and begin to let them breathe. If not, uh, go ahead and open up, open them up, uh, pour, your pour yourself a glass of wine um, and uh, let, those, um, let those things kind of stretch their legs a little bit. Um, as usual, I'll talk through a couple of housekeeping, some etiquette things. Um, you know, I, I encourage you always to ask questions. Um, for many of you, Argentina and Chile will be uh, a new uh, part of the world when it comes to wine. So ask questions, um, group chat is open. Um, and then of course you can always um, unmute yourselves and uh, ask questions straight away. Don't even uh, worry about interrupting, just uh, let it fly. Uh, and then, of course, um, if you're uh, have, you have a kind of a fun setup tonight uh, with some food and wine, uh, be sure to uh, uh, tag Jones is Thirsty on Instagram. Uh, love to see um, love to see what you're up to. And then um, tonight's uh, virtual tip jar uh, goes to uh, Make a Wish, uh, Alabama. And I'm sure many of you know about Make a Wish as a national umbrella organization, um, but we have a chapter here in Alabama. And uh, they're going to be the beneficiaries of tonight's tip jar. So you can uh, make those tips or donate those tips uh, via Venmo at Jones is Thirsty. So at Jones is Thirsty on Venmo. And I hope that Elizabeth Tucker is on. I do see Elizabeth at the top. Um, Elizabeth, if you're on, I would love for you to uh, maybe say a couple of words about, um, about Make-A-Wish. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get you unmuted there. Are you there? Yes, can y'all hear me? Elizabeth, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am terrific. I'm going to um, share my screen, and uh, I've got a couple of slides here that you can talk through. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for thinking of us and for inviting me to the happy hour tonight. I'm really excited to talk to y'all a little bit about Make-A-Wish, and I really appreciate you, Scott. Um, yeah, Make-A-Wish of Alabama, where together we create life-changing wishes for children with critical illnesses. Um, that's very important because I think it's very common for people to think we grant wishes to children with terminal illnesses or um, just to kids with cancer, and that's not the case. Um, many of our kids do have cancer or they do have terminal illnesses, but that's not the criteria. Um, in fact, a lot of our kids do end up living healthy lives and going on to have full long lives and we believe very strongly that the wish is part of that. Um, Scott's right, we do, we are a local chapter of a national organization. So we do operate locally even though we have national resources to help us. Um, we grant wishes in all 67 counties of Alabama. So we work directly with kids in each of your communities 
and any money raised in Alabama goes right to Alabama kids. And since 2012, as you can see, that's when we became a chapter, um, we have granted over 1,000 wishes and we are on our way to our next thousand. So the average cost of a wish is $8,000. That is because there's no cost to the family. We consider it to be a free gift and something that is a reprieve from a difficult season in their life. So let's say a kid wants a travel wish. That means their lodging, their transportation, activities, meals, anything else they could want are totally covered by the chapter and by the donations that we receive. That's very important to us because that's part of the power of a wish. Um, we actually have a very small staff. There's only 13 of us who do this work in across Alabama. And so we depend on our volunteers who help us grant wishes. We have regional councils across the state who assist with fundraising, raising awareness and participating in wish granting. Our boards, our social workers and healthcare workers who refer kids and families to us. So it truly is a community network in every community in Alabama and across the state. Um, some information on wishes. I love talking about wishes. I used to grant them. I have changed positions. I used to grant and process all of the wishes in the state. Um, but the first wish type is probably the most common and the most well known, it's to go. Um, these are incredibly powerful, whether it is a Disney wish for a three-year-old or a young lady who wants to go to Paris, France for her first international excursion. It is a reprieve and a time away from the therapy appointments and the hospitalizations and clinicals. Um, many of our kids spend a lot of time at home or indoors. Um, this has been a hard season with quarantine. We are, it's very new to many of us, but it is not new to WISH families because they often have to quarantine themselves during flu season because they have immune issues and compromises. So a travel WISH is very, very powerful. Some of our kids wish to be something. They want to step out of being the sick kid and they get to be a police officer or a zookeeper. Um, in the first slide, you saw little Kushi. She was to be a princess. And so she got to be um, the princess of the Huntsville Christmas Parade in 2018. And she had a whole day of royal treatment. Um, we've had a little boy who wanted to be a firefighter. He was three years old and they set a contained safe fire, but a fire for him. And he got to hose it out and dress up like a firefighter and be, he got to be his hero for a day. Um, another wish is a wish to have. So whether it is a shopping spree, so a kid can go and just go wild and ride a limousine all day and be treated like a VIP at every store or a play set in their backyard. Alyssa here wanted to have an art studio, and she actually creates beautiful art that she's donated to Make-A-Wish that has raised about $50,000 at auction. So she is not only an incredible wish kid who got exactly what she wanted, but she actually has given back to us in a big way. Celebrity wishes are very important because, as I said, a lot of kids spend a time indoors, um, whether that's in the hospital or at their homes kind of locked away. So they watch a lot of TV, they listen to a lot of music, and their characters or the actors or actresses become so important to them. And really these people or these characters, um, whether it's to go to Disney and meet Elsa or to meet The Rock um, Johnson, they are their heroes because they get them through dark seasons. So to meet wishes are incredibly important and transformative. Um, wishes, we say they're more than a nice thing, they're a necessary thing because so many of our kids don't have the hope and the joy that's taken from them because they're children dealing with something that really no one should have to deal with. And they're persevering through it and wishes give them something to get out of that for a moment and they remember it for the rest of their lives and it continues to have an impact on them years down the road. So we don't view it as frivolous or anything like that. It's very much a part of their health care and a part of their life and recovery. So. Thank y'all, and I do hope y'all consider donating to us. Like I said, every dollar goes right to Wish Kids, and it's very impactful, life-changing work. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I appreciate, um, like many of us, all the great work that you do. And I'm telling you, if you guys ever want to get like a shot of just absolute inspiration, follow them on any of the social media uh, outlets, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Twitter, and you see the faces on those kids. It's un it's unbelievable. It's such a such a special uh, thing that uh, Make a Wish does. So, uh, Elizabeth, thank you so very much. Yeah. Um, all right, and uh, we have uh, another special guest joining us tonight, uh, Carlos Cisneros. Carlos, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I, think I saw you a little bit earlier. Hey, Carlos, how are you? 
Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Carlos is going to be my wingman tonight. Uh, I've known Carlos for a, a good while. Um, he is uh, uh, one of the faces of Pleasure is All Wine, which is a terrific uh, wine store in Pelham. Uh, but Carlos, you are a certified sommelier, and I can't tell you how many times people ask me, what the heck is a sommelier? So now I'm putting you on the spot. Tell us what it means to be a certified sommelier. I see you have your pen on. Yeah, so, uh, it, you know, and actually I'm wearing my pen because every time I don't wear it, like people get upset with me. They're like, <laughs> why didn't you wear the pen? I'm like, all right, fine, I'll wear the pen. Um, and actually it's the first time I've worn it since like February. I think the okay. last time I wore it was uh, Pinot Camp, you know, because of the whole COVID thing, we haven't been able to, uh, you know, partake in any, any trade shows or anything. But um, right. yeah, what is a sommelier? I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. I, I'm kidding. Um, because I, it's, the definition has definitely changed over the years. But um, it, it, essentially, we're, we're just we're, uh, service experts and, uh, and beverage experts. Um, okay. A lot of people think that you know, we're wine experts, but it's more of we're, like we, we look, overlook the world of beverages, whether it's uh, bottled waters or sake or scotch or, you know, it, basically, okay. if you can drink it, we got to know it. Because like, let's say if I, I worked at um, 11 Madison Park, you know, Pine Restaurant or a Michelin star restaurant, and I get a guest that comes into the restaurant and they don't drink wine, but they want to pair something with their food. So yeah, yeah I can't, can't really bow and say, well, you know, I, I don't know anything about scotch. Like we have to, we have to have, you know, like a very vast knowledge of, of, uh, of the beverage world. And um, our exam is one of the only exams that has a service portion. So we ha also have to, you know, be able to know how to pour wine correctly and to make good recommendations with food pairings and uh, that's pretty much it. Okay, well, one thing that I'll ask is you don't judge as you're looking at the group, you know, all the folks that are joining tonight, don't judge if they're holding the bottle incorrectly or if they're turning the bottle up and drinking it straight out of the bottle or if they don't no, have a never. little server yet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you being here, Carlos. Um, and uh, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll have some fun talking about Chile. Uh, uh, thank you for now, having me. I really, I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Oh yeah, listen, my pleasure. It's cool. it's cool to have uh, a certified sommelier on. Um, I do want to say uh, something. Um, I have got some terrific feedback after the last um, uh, event from a uh, a early adopter to the Jones's Thirsty philosophy. Uh, he sent me uh, a very nice uh, email saying, you know what? man, we love going through these tastings, but sometimes we kind of, you know, are having fun in our own little place and we forget which wine that you're actually talking about. Uh, and so um, I, um, I'm going to try something new tonight. I've converted my headband's headband into a way for <laughs> everyone to know which wine we'll be discussing. And so I'm going to switch these cards out and hopefully y'all can read this. I tried, my handwriting's not so good but hopefully you'll be able to see which wines that we're, uh, we're talking about at any particular time. And as you can see, uh, the first wine we're gonna talk about is this Amato Sur uh, from Argentina. So um, let me, uh, I know a lot of you, cause you've already you know, uh, sent in some emails saying that um, South America is a, is a, a wine um, uh, region, uh, whether it's, uh, Chile or um, Uruguay, uh, Brazil, Argentina that you want to learn about. Um, so what I thought I would do is um, at least um, uh, show quickly um, a map so you can get a sense of, of, uh, of what you're looking at. So I, um, the, the opening slide for Argentina, um, I wanted to show a couple of things. So um, we'll, we'll talk about this, but the Andes Mountains really uh, splits Chile and Argentina. And that uh, mountain range, the Andes, um, is the largest mountain range in the world outside of the Himalayas. So it's the, um, the largest uh, mountain range in the southern and western hemispheres. And so uh, this picture in the upper left-hand corner is a picture of uh, Mount uh, Akangawa um, taken from my seat in the plain. That's how tall it is. Those are the clouds, and, uh, and that's the mountain. Uh, the mountain is about uh, uh, just under 20,000 feet high. Uh, Mount Everest is about 28. Um, 
At the bottom is uh, a shot of um, Bottega uh, Catena Zapata Winery. And um, uh, Mr. Catena is considered probably like, think of him like the, the uh, Robert Mondavi of, of Argentina. He is the one that is credited with really moving um, Argentina from producing mediocre bulk wines into creating world-class wines. And uh, Nicholas Catena, who is the father, um, has now um, kind of semi-retired. His daughter, Laura Catena, runs the winery, and uh, her brother, Ernesto, also makes wine in Argentina. Um, and they both also happen to be um, Stanford grads. Uh, Laura is also a doctor, and then she, so she works uh, at an emergency room in San Francisco, but also uh, spends a lot of time making wine in Mendoza. The family's just nuts, but it's incredible what they're doing. And then on the right-hand side, this is a shot when I was standing on top of the winery looking out at the Andes, and that's not a doctored photo, uh, but it's almost, uh, it just, it's just weird to see uh, a mountain range that's so tall, uh, and uh, that gives you some perspective on the high elevation vineyards uh, that, are in, um, that are in Argentina. So uh, much of the population in Argentina is made up largely of um, Italian and, and Spanish immigrants, and that's also reflected in the, um, the country's wine production. Um, what I want you to know here is that Argentina is a giant, <laughs> it's a giant country. Um, and, I, and I put this little arrow here from Mendoza City to Buenos Aires is um, about 650 miles. So if you drove uh, from Mendoza City um, to Buenos Aires, you're looking at about a 12-hour a um, drive. So I just wanted to give you some perspective on then how large the, the province of Mendoza is. And if you ever um, go to Mendoza to visit uh, for uh, you know, the wineries, each winery is like 90 minutes apart from each other. Um, so it's a pretty wide open place. Um, and um, the, the thing that um, I want you to know about Argentina is that it's, um, it's like no other place on earth in terms of, of um, uh, wine growing. Um, the Andes, that huge mountain range creates this incredible rain shadow so everything um, east of the Andes um, is, uh, you know, it's super dry. Um, they have lots of uh, available irrigation because the snow melt from the Andes provides lots of water. There's very little humidity there. And we'll talk about that when we get to Chile, but it's real dry, almost unlimited sunshine because there are very few clouds there. And the, um, the, uh, vineyards are at incredibly high elevation. So up here in Salta, in the northern part of the uh, Argentine wine growing region, um, some of those vineyards are at 10,000 feet elevation. Uh, down here in Mendoza, uh, those vineyards are typically any, you know, anywhere between, say, 2,000 and 4,000 feet elevation. So um, in the world of wine growing, that is pretty, uh, pretty unique. Um, and um, let me go back up to that slide. So the wines that we're going to be having tonight, both this um, Amado Sur and the um, Tinta Negra are from uh, this area here in Mendoza. You have uh, Luján de Coyo, uh, uh, Maipo, and uh, Tupangado. And so the grapes are largely sourced from those areas. Now, um, we could spend uh, weeks talking about Argentina, but for the purposes of kind of an introduction to Argentina, um, we're going to concentrate on um, on uh, Mendoza. So let's uh, let's bounce out from there and uh, talk a little bit about this first um, first wine, this uh, Amado Sur. So um, go ahead and take a a good sniff of what's in the glass. Take a good uh, good sip. Um, and I picked this wine because it's a blend. Um, uh, Argentina, the primary red grape there is Malbec. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is a blend of Malbec, 
and uh, about 20% of uh, another grape called Bernarda, which is um, grown a little bit in Italy. Uh, it was one of the historic grapes in the early 19th century in California, but it's, um, it's one of the early red grapes that uh, was cultivated in Argentina. And then this has a little bit of, um, a little bit of Syrah in it. Um, Carlos, I would ask you, just from a, a blending standpoint, I mean, I know um, of, of Argentina as mostly as um, Malbec, 100% varietals. Are you seeing that there are more blends coming out in, uh, in Argentina now, or what's your take on that? Absolutely. Uh, so they are starting to do a lot more blends because in the United States, you know, like California and, and, and other areas the you know, it seems like red blends are being uh, found more on people's tables than just yeah. doing straight, uh, straight varietal wines. Uh, Bernarda is one of my absolute favorite grapes grown out of, out of Argentina. It's the second most planted red grape in Argentina. And uh, they just make these really big, just, just dark, just so full-bodied wines. Yeah. Um, but, real plumbing, uh, I remember. Yeah, real, very real plumbing. plumbing. Yeah, very ripe. And yeah. especially with like the Malbec, uh, for people that don't like wines that are too tannic, uh, I usually recommend Malbec because the tannins tend to be real powdery in Malbecs. They're not as astringent as they are in like Cabernet Sauvignon or, right. or uh, you know, other like maybe like Italian wines that tend to have a lot of tannin to them. Uh, so if you want something more of like that, I usually equate it to like cocoa powder. Because you kind of yeah. get those chocolatey notes from from the uh, Malbec, but then right. you know the the powderiness from from the wine as well. So, but yeah, no, yeah. The red blends they're they're making fantastic stuff there. And the other thing that I thought was interesting, um, and you can absolutely um, I can I can I get that that lack of of it on the nose, which is this um, this wine is all stainless steel. It gets no oak, right? And so yeah. you just get that. I mean, I just get that fresh fruit, that kind of cherry blackberry um without that oakiness and we'll get a little bit of oak in the tinta negra and then we'll definitely get oak in the cab from from chile but i you know i wanted to start with no oak and work your way up but again this is a really to me a, a really interesting wine and pretty food friendly because it has that bernardo which gives it some good mouthfeel and a little bit of that syrah which for yeah. me i got a uh, some of that uh peppery uh, kind of thing going on and uh, was really, uh, really delicious. Yeah. So to touch on what you just said, now there are people, you know, you have, you have your people that, you know, like black coffee and there are people yeah. that got to have cream in their coffee. There are people yeah. that love oak and there are people that don't want any oak influence on their wines whatsoever. So if you're shopping and you find a Malbec and if you find one that says Reserva on the label, it's yeah. mandated that reservas have to be aged at least one year in, in oak. So if you like a Malbec with a little bit more oak influence, look for ones that say reserva. I know I carry three, two or three at the shop where I work at, but Got you it. know, that way, you know, for our customers that like oaky wines or they don't like oaky because uh, you know, some for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I got a note earlier that someone um, couldn't find this particular blend so they um they got one of michel roland's his uh the siete uh, one, which is more of a bordeaux blend but it's uh again th this is this is kind of a, a junkyard dog of blends you have you know malbec from bordeaux you've got syrah from the rhone and then you've got bernarda from argentina so it's kind of this you know a kind of a fun blend but i know that michel roland's is is pretty true to those Bordeaux varietals. And that's a, also, you know, a phenomenal uh, red blend. So I, I got to ask, did they say it was the uh, Michel Roland's, the Clos de los Siete? Yeah, it was the Siete, yeah. Oh, that's, that wine is insanely good, yeah, by the way. Yeah, and it's, don't, it's don't get me started nuts. on Michel Roland. He is a fan. To, he, so Michel Roland, to me, he's like my hero in the wine world. I mean, you start yeah. talking about Michel Roland, my ears go up. Like, I absolutely love, love what he does. So, yeah, but yeah, for those of you who don't know him, um, he's kind of the, the traveling winemaker to the stars. So he was born in Pomerol, um, so on the right bank of Bordeaux. Um, but he, he not only makes his own wine, but he consults and makes wine all over the world. And um, he is, I, I don't know what it is, he has kind of the Midas touch and whatever he makes uh, tends to be <laughs> pretty pretty great, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
fantastic yeah. stuff. So um, for those of you who were able to get the Amato Sir, uh, anyone want to kind of maybe offer up some comments about, uh, about this particular wine? Um, I, I, you know, this is again, a, a blend of grapes that are really phenomenal, but the fact that it doesn't have a lot of oak, I just find to be uh, pretty interesting and, and really uh, easy drinking. Very smooth, very fruity. Um, you know, I expected, um, I think, well, it, I'm sure that a lot of folks uh, probably uh, were expecting much more of stringent tannins on the palate, but uh, anyone want to unmute themselves and um, give us a little insight into what you, what you thought about these? If not, I won't pick on anyone yet. I'll wait until the next one to pick on anyone. But uh, yeah, don't be shy. We won't pick you apart. We just we we love we love hearing what people have to say. Yeah, um, especially myself. You know, like e even people that consider themselves novices or experts. You know, I always learn something from uh, from whatever people have to oh, say. So right, yeah. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm totally interrupting. No, no. Well, I, I told you. Michelle Roland and are absolutely loving it. Yeah. It was recommended to us as a substitute, and it is not disappointing. It's so delicious. Yeah, it's a that's a pretty special wine uh, for sure. And uh, I imagine if you had a a big old ribeye off the grill, that would be uh, kind of just what you're just what the doctor ordered. Well, we are having some filet mignon sliders. Oh, good. Well, there you go. <laughs> right, right. Fantastic. Thank you yeah. guys so much. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, in terms of food, Carlos, you know, this wine, I mean, I, this, this is, this is a really great wine with barbecue. I guess I find myself these tastes these days talking about how I really enjoy uh, red wine and barbecue, but really, truly um, kind of that fruit flavor, uh, you know, the, the, the cherry blackberry um, of this wine to me, this with like, um, you know, barbecue chicken thighs or barbecue drumsticks with uh, kind of a, you know, uh, not too sweet, but a, you know, a nice, uh, good old uh, slathering of barbecue sauce on it uh, is, um, is just absolutely delicious. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, to touch on what you had mentioned earlier about, you know, the blends, Malbec, to some people, they feel like it won't hold up to red meat. And you know, I'll be honest, some of them don't. I mean, some of them just don't really have enough yeah. to like stand up to the fattiness of a ribeye. But when they blend them with Bernarda and when they blend them with a little Cabernet or especially Syrah, it really gives it backbone. Like it really gives it like the Syrah can contribute that savoriness and that pepperiness, yeah. that echo those flavors that you'll get from the seasoning on, on them. And that Bernarda adds some depth and some fruit and just enough to, you know, have enough tannin to, for, you know, to adhere to the proteins on, on the, you know, from the meats that, that, you know, gives that sensation in the mouth that we all really enjoy when we're pairing wine with food. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I'm gonna uh, switch my. Um, normally, you know, I'm not allowed to look at the card when we play headbands, but I'm gonna I'm gonna switch out the um, the card to the uh, the uh, Tinto Negro. But while we're um, while we're looking at this next wine, a couple of things that I want to mention that are also um, unique to um, to uh, Argentina. Uh, first. Um, you have uh, in the spring and in the summer, you can get these Zonda winds that come through and can do a lot of damage. I mean, they're, they, um, uh, they uh, can be pretty fierce winds. And then uh, they also get uh, right around harvest uh, in the fall, they can get some pretty uh, catastrophic uh, hailstorms, which can just uh, beat the fruit to death. And I remember my first visit to Argentina I remember going to a vineyard and all of the vines were netted and they had these little like uh, wooden um, uh, kind of, they, they looked like screen doors, but they, um, at the end of the vineyard, they would press this little trigger and the, and the netting would just cover, immediately cover the vines. And I thought, um, well, they must do that because, you know, I, maybe, you know, they're giant deer that come through the, vineyards or the birds eat all the grapes and uh, the winemaker said no we've got to do this because those hailstorms pop up in a second uh right when the right as the uh fruit is ripening and it can just devastate the entire harvest so um if you see uh pictures of vineyards in argentina many times you'll see uh netting over the top of them uh to protect them from uh, a lot of that hail damage 
which is um, kind of unique to, to that Mendoza area. Um, so, Scott, I want to yeah. ask you a quick question. When you were in Argentina, did you get to see the way that they, um, uh, the way that they, they do the Paral system, how they put oh, the yeah. vines up? That must be really cool. Absolutely. See, I, that, uh, and, yeah, and that's I, pretty and unique. Maybe uh, <laughs> I could only pull um, a few images, but I actually had a lunch underneath um, uh, a, a, a vineyard that was set up and elevated like that. And yeah. um, I've always wanted to do that with muscadines in my backyard because it's just, it's beautiful and it provides shade, but it's a, it's a real unique, like a real old school way. Um, and that, that actually, as we talk about uh, Malbec, um, that's one of the things I want to talk about with you is the unique um, uh, climate there, very little ozone in that part of uh, the Southern hemisphere. So Chile and Argentina, um, get a lot of really just um, full-on UV. So these grapes develop very thick, like unusually thick skins to keep them from getting sunburnt. And um, as a result, the thicker skins are going to give off more color, more flavor. You know, they're going to just make um, potentially, you know, richer, um, uh, richer wines. But uh, one of the reasons they use that unique trellising system is to keep the you know, so not only is it kind of easier to harvest, but it, it uh, keeps the grapes from, allows them to ripen a little more slow because uh, you don't want them to ripen too fast because they might look like they're ripe, but the seeds are still green on the inside and they can, I mean, Carlos, you would know this, they add like a, I always call it like a, a green bell pepper. I think it's pyrazine maybe is what it's called, but it's a- Pyrazines, yeah. It's like a, tastes like green bell peppers, I guess. Yeah, well, that's that's one of when you would mentioned the Zonda winds there. That's one of the yeah. reasons why they use the Peral system is because if they, it, you know, we've all seen pictures of vineyards and sorry, my drinking buddy's bothering me right here. He's I got my dog with me today. <laughs> it's not my kids, it's my dog. But so, anyways, um, yeah. So they use the Peral system because the winds are so strong there. Like I know we've all seen pictures of of grapevines, what they usually look like, but the winds yeah. can literally blow these grapevines over and they can uproot them. So they put them on these systems, these trellising systems that go in like an arc and you can walk underneath them and the grapes are dangling yeah, down above your head. down. And yeah. Right, exactly. So it helps with sun exposure. It helps uh, from uh, them getting blown over uh, from the wind and it also prevents from rot. So like any yeah. kind of disease, you know, like it, it allows the wind to kind of, you know, uh, to go back and forth through the, vine through the vines to where they're not, um, you know, they, they won't be affected by any type of, uh, any type of rot. So that, but, so to help, just so, so people will know, Carlos, explain a little bit about that because, um, you know, any little bit of extra moisture in when, where those grapes are so tightly bunched can cause like mildew and all sorts of unwanted nasty things. And so, right. you know, as you were saying, the wind helps with that, right? Well, I mean, anybody that, you know, if any of you garden at home, it's, it's, the, it's the same scenario. You know, like I grow, I, I have a lot of tomato plants outside, so I have to prune them. You know, I have to make sure that they're seeing it, getting just enough water, but not enough, you know, not too much. And Argentina is a really tricky area to grow grapes because of the elevation and, and the terrain and the winds and everything. So uh, uh, in Mendoza, they average eight inches of rain a year, like eight inches of rain. That's nothing. So that's why they have to depend on irrigation for, with, from the snow that melts up in the Andes it runs down through these rivers and you know that's where they 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 use the irrigation not only that when you're growing grapes at that high of an elevation look at it this way so if you have the valley floor and you have grapes planted at the bottom they're going to have a certain amount of uv rays and a certain amount of sunlight but if you raise these grapes 8000 feet up in the air technically they're closer to the sun yeah. so the uv rays are going to be a lot more harsh but it's a lot cooler, you know, like in higher elevated areas. Like if you've ever been to Colorado and you go through the mountains and stuff, it's, it's much cooler. So they benefit. Grapes really like two things. They like really hot sunlight and they like really cool air. Those two things really help them thrive and produce the wines that we like to drink. Um, on top of that, uh, I, Scott, what you had mentioned earlier about, you know, the skins on the grapes, you got to yeah. look at it. A grape is like the mother and inside is its children. Those are the seeds. Well, whenever they get, they get in, in um, contact with, this, with really harsh sunlight, 
in order to protect those seeds and to sustain themselves, they naturally grow thicker skins. It's kind of like yeah. calluses on the bottom of our feet. You know, like when we're walking, you know, like we develop calluses to adapt to our surroundings. Well, they get thicker skins and winemakers really want that because with thicker skins can add more tannin, add more depth, add more color because of the, uh, the, uh, the pigmentation from, you know, from the uh, grapes. So um, yeah, Argentina is like a, it can be a pretty difficult area to, to grow wine, but they've adapted really well to be able to uh, produce the wines that they do using certain techniques. Yeah, yeah, that's all, all great information. Thank you. Um, and You're that, that kind of leads us to the next wine, which is that the Tinto Negra, which is, um, you know, kind of a classic example of um, a Malbec. And if you remember in that image that I showed of Catena Zapata, uh, the winemaker there, Alejandro uh, Sejanovic, um, who's been their winemaker for many, many years. Uh, Tinto Negra is like his side project. Um, and so you have this renowned winemaker that is um, doing his own little spin on, on, um, on Malbec. And the wine we had before had, was mostly aged in all stainless steel, had some aging in the bottle. This one uh, gets... Uh, Minimal oak, I guess I would say, and the oak that it does get is in uh, used barrels. So um, it's they're not new barrels that might add additional tannins. Um, it's just getting the a little bit of influence of the wood. So like I can on the nose, you know, I don't get a ton of uh, of oak influence, but I can just get a little bit of that. You know, it just the nose is is different. That aroma is different than the than the la than you know the amato sur. You can tell that something a little different happened there. But still that bright fruit, um, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of a, to me, a, an earthier aroma uh, than that fresh, vibrant fruit of the Amato Sur. Um, but um, I guess we'll take a sip and see what everyone thinks. Yeah, I can definitely feel uh, that Malbec. I can get the tannins here. It's not that the first wine, softer, more round. This, um, I get, uh, my mouth is watering under my tongue. You get that acidity, but I get that, that uh, you know, kind of light uh, uh, tannin across my, across my tongue. Uh, so you definitely got something going on here a little different with, uh, with all of the, with 100% Malbec. Looks like uh, I see a bunch of comments here. Uh, Suzanne and Scott are having a, a big cheese board and they love the Tinto Negro with the, with the wines, I mean, with the cheeses. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, tapis, yeah, here in um, uh, Tapis is a great, a great Malbec. I love, um, I love what they do. Um, that's a great, great choice, good value. Um, but, um, Carlos, what do you think about this um, this Tinto Negro? I mean, this is yeah. Uh, I think it's go ahead. Yeah, I think it's really good. I like that it has like this little tart cherry. Yeah, uh, for sure. To, but then it also has like a cola, like a, like a cherry cola type, without being too sweet. Um, yeah, I, I think it's good. It's about. I'm a little suspicious about the alcohol on this, though. I don't know if you saw when I tasted it. I, I kind of frowned a little bit, like, hmm, because uh, yeah. the bottle says it's 13.5, but I'm, I'm yeah. suspecting this may be like a 14, 14.5, because I got yeah, a little it, bit of a, yeah, little burn it's, there. It, it's it's yeah. When I opened them up earlier, when I was tasting this against the uh, the cab, which is a which is 14 and a half, because I definitely got uh, a you know good pop of alcohol there. But this is um. Yeah. You know, I, it's um, it's interesting. Um, let's see, uh, Dana's saying that, um, yeah, that she likes the Tinto Negra more than the Amato Sur. And you know, if you if you like, I do too. <laughs> yeah, if you, I mean, it's it's I do too. It's probably the Bonarda yeah, did it though. I love Bonarda. <laughs> yeah, Bonarda is a is a good one. And and again, I, that's why yeah. I wanted to try a blend that had Bonarda in it, so um, folks could get to know that. Um, I love uh, the wines from Zuccardi. And Zuccardi does a wonderful Bernarda. But if you're looking for just trying something off the beaten path, uh, um, Carlos, do you do y'all carry um, uh, varietal Bernardas, or is that something you can get? Um, okay, and, so a little bit of a soapbox. It's like yeah. Bernarda, Bernarda, five or six years ago, you could find for like 
eight or nine dollars a bottle. And I'm talking delicious, really high quality, great. But I mean, I can pour it blind for like 10 of my friends and have them try it. And they'll go, oh my God, this is amazing. Bernardo's fantastic. So now, fast forward five or six years later, Bernardo's like in the 18, 19, 20 dollar range. I'm yeah. like, how dare you? Like, <laughs> you know, they, they like <laughs> raise the price on it. I don't yeah. know. Okay, so I don't know if that has to do with like demand or if it has yeah. to do with like, oh my God, we have something really good here and people are buying it up. Maybe we left money on the table or maybe yeah. there's something with like, maybe they pulled up a bunch of vines, they stopped planting it. So now it costs more. I don't know. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, I don't have any at the shop. I've been searching and searching and searching for some really good Bernardo, but I've, I've, I'm still on that path trying to, trying to pick some up. So, yeah. yeah. Well, one thing, I did want to, <laughs> one thing I did want to ask you, Carlos, I noticed in both of these, um, they're, they're both pretty fresh wines. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean they're, yeah. they're young, no doubt about it, but they both have, you know, really fresh acidity. Um, do you think that that is um, really attributed to those, that high elevation, cool nights? So, you know, they're not burning off all the acidity with these, you know, really warm uh, temperatures getting toward um, harvest or because uh, I'm assuming that that's really what preserves a lot of that freshness is the, those cool nights. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, like I, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the cold weather is really good for the grapes to cool them off. That way they do have that little bit of acidity. And that's yeah. what we love about you know, whenever we have a, a, a gin and tonic, you put a squeeze of lime in there because you want that acid, you want that balance. Or, you know, like when you're eating fish, you know, some people put a squeeze of lemon on there because that acidity with the fish, like it yeah. just, just goes well. And that's the whole yeah. point of pairing wine with food because you want that acid to really back up everything that you're having in that dish. So yeah, yeah but the, the, the cool air from the high elevation is definitely contributing to this because I really can't think of any uh, producers that are acidifying their wines using acidification yeah, sure but sure. i mean it could be possible but yeah. why when you have that type of elevation i mean that's you know that's like that's like putting salt on your on your chinese food like it's, yeah. it's not gonna need it salty salty enough yeah. you don't need it yeah well, well speaking of, of of salt um you know for those of you who um uh got uh, cured meats or anything with salt in it on your for dinner tonight you'll you'll see that when you have like that maybe salty cured meat with a, a slug of the Malbec, it really even more, it softens those tannins even more. Um, that's one of the fun things about doing these sensory experiments with, with red wine is that salt and fat are easy to demonstrate with like a cheese and charcuterie board and red wine. So um, I hope you guys will, will check that out, but salt will definitely soften those. And then of course the fat of, of cheese or, I mean, I, I, I love this Malbec with pimento cheese. And that's just something that I, I, I love. Because um, the acidity, yeah, you know, it's just, it's, it's delicious. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, if you have um, like uh, prosciutto or a salami or something, definitely um, uh, try that with a swig of this. And you'll notice that uh, hopefully the tannins in the wine will feel a little bit different than uh, when you just have the wine on its own. Um, Let's see, um, let's see, Bernarda. Okay, so Jay uh, said that he's, um, <laughs> said he's on the hunt for uh, Bernarda and uh, he's gonna uh, track some down in, uh, in Birmingham. Um, so I I'd love to hear from someone uh, if you're uh, willing to unmute yourself and let us know what you think about, uh, about um, the uh, either either one of the wines uh, based on what you're you're trying there. Anyone uh, had enough wine to be um, to be uh, uh, adventurous at this point? Looks like um, Alexandra said she has it with Serrano ham and uh, Catalan bread. Uh, that sounds like a, a pretty wonderful pretty wonderful pairing. Um, anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Okay, I'm going through the, the group comments. So it looks like everyone wants to stay uh, focused on typing and uh, not talking at this point. Um, hey, Scott, that's okay. good. hey Scott, yeah. this is Rob here. You can, the, hey, the difference between the, um, just the tannins and the second yeah. one from the first yeah. one. I mean, it's notable. The first one just slides right through and this one hangs mm -hmm. around a little longer. 
both are very nice, but you can really yeah. tell. Yeah, it's a great it's a great experiment when someone says they like a smooth wine. Um, that that first one really is um, uh, more smooth. Uh, this one you're definitely starting to pick up, even though it's not a real full bodied wine. It still to me feels kind of medium body, um, but you start to definitely feel more of those tannins, which you know gives you an indication of of how you might pair it uh, with food. It can you know yeah, handle something. Go ahead. I, I saw somebody uh, just post that they had theirs with goat cheese, with hard goat cheese. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorite. I love goat cheese with red wine. It is so yeah. good because that, that softness, you know, from, from the, the texture of the cheese with the yeah. tannins and, and like goat cheese can have, can be just a little acidic. And yeah. I think it just really just echoes those, that like, like the, the texture and like the finish of, of red wine. So yeah, Absolutely. I mean, you'll, yeah, you'll see big logs of goat cheese in my fridge at all times <laughs> because it's one of my like. You can keep the cheddar cheese and everything. Else. Like I'm, I'm going towards goat cheese like nine times out of ten. So yeah, okay. good call. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah, that's uh, Dana. Thanks for uh, for passing that along. Um, all right. Well, I'm gonna switch my hat now uh, or my my headbands, and we'll uh, we'll talk about the uh, the cab. And um, I, uh, I'll share my screen and uh, we'll quickly look at um, a map of uh, Chile. So the first thing I wanted to do is, um, is show a few more images. So this is um, actually Akangawa uh, from the Chilean side. So Argentina is just on the other side of that mountain. Um, but this is what it looks like from vineyards in Chile. And then uh, the image in the upper right-hand corner is um, Viña uh, Indomita. And this is a uh, vineyard or a, a winery that's uh, in the Casablanca Valley. So you actually pass this as you're driving down to the coast, uh, heading to Valparaiso. And um, the reason that I included this is because uh, Chile has a, uh, in terms of their climate, it's a total 180 from uh, from Argentina. And it's much more like, uh, to me, it's like being in California, like the Central Coast. And you can see that, um, you can see these kind of uh, shrub covered um, uh, little uh, uh, coastal mountains, but you can see how green it is. Uh, and it's very, uh, very much like California. And so this is, um, this winery is, you know, less than uh, probably 20 minutes from the uh, Pacific Ocean. And then uh, down here in the lower uh, right-hand corner is the uh, Via Rica volcano, uh, which is one of Chile's most um, active volcanoes. And um, I I've never been to Chile or Argentina where there hasn't been um, an earthquake while I was there. And um, I, I guess the, the seismic activity is, is um, happens uh, you know all the time in fact I remember the first time I stayed in a hotel in Santiago um, all of the elevators um, have a big placard that has an earthquake um, exit plan that's how often they have tremors there it doesn't bother them but it um, uh, traveling from Alabama it was a little a uh, little strange um, so this is uh, this is Chile and um, I, I think that uh, you know, I wanted to spend just a minute talking about this. In terms of the length of the country, you're looking at a country that's about 2,700 miles long, but it's really only about 100 miles wide. And uh, this map that we're looking at um, represents about 800 miles um, in terms of north to south of the country that's devoted to viticulture. And in Chile, the um, north to south uh, or let me just say this, the east to west um, of the country is just as important as uh, north to south. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, it's going to get colder as you get further down here to Patagonia and Tierra del Fuego. Um, but you have this really cold Pacific Ocean here, and there's a current that runs right down um, the coast of Chile called the Humboldt Current, and the water is just frigid. So it makes the, um, the uh, air 
and the wind that comes off the Pacific, very cool. And so they really, they split the country into thirds. So you have uh, the zone that's closest to the water, the costa is the coastal zone. And then you have this middle, um, the, uh, the in, kind of in between the mountain range, and then you have the Andes. And each one of those gives kind of a different um, kind of microclimate from top to bottom. And um, the other thing that is really cool to know about Chile is that um, it's one of the few places on the planet that is, um, um, if you have uh, know, you know, read up about wine, there's uh, this um, um, wines uh, in, you know, the Phloxera, Phloxera is, is one of the uh, most devastating uh, events that have ever happened in the world of wine. And, um, in, and um, it's happened, um, you know, vine, vineyards around the world have been, a, you know, um, been affected by phylloxera. And um, Chile is one of the few places on earth where uh, they've never been, uh, it's phylloxera free. And uh, part of that is because of its unique natural barriers. So at the very, at the top of, of Chile, you have the uh, Atacama Desert, which is one of the driest places on earth. Uh, and then you have the Pacific Ocean to the west, you have the Andes mountain range to the east, and then you have um, the Tierra del Fuego. So you have basically a frozen, um, you know, frozen landmass at the bottom. And so it's, um, it's kind of, you know, kind of hemmed in by all of these natural barriers. But the, the, what, what we're going to be looking at tonight is the Central Valley region, um, and in particular the uh, Colchagua. And that's mm -hmm. where the grapes from uh, this wine um, come in. And, um, and so this is, if you, let's see here. So there's uh, Valparaiso. Uh, here's Santiago. So if you flew into Chile, you would be right in the very top of the Central Valley region, Santiago. And then you could come down to Maipo, or if you were going to Valparaiso on the coast, uh, you would pass Casablanca. Uh, oh yeah, uh, Vinta, yeah, the Ventascaro is, 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 um, is a fantastic place for sure. Uh, you have uh, the San Antonio um, and all of these um, little uh, areas here are just um, really just beautifully set up uh, for winemaking. So um, just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, they have a, a, a large influence of um, of um, Bordeaux varietals there that were um, brought to Chile uh, in the 1800s. So you see a lot, a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. That's probably, you know, historically the big white grape of, of Chile. Um, you see some Sauvignon, which is another Bordeaux white grape. You see some Chardonnay. Uh, but in terms of red wines, it's mostly Cabernet. Um, they have a grape, uh, Carmenere, which you might see as a varietal grape, which until I don't know, Carlos, until like the 80s or 90s, they thought was Merlot until someone told them, hey, by the way, this is not Merlot. This is actually Carmenere. Uh, but you see some Cab Franc, you see some Syrah. And um, I, I guess it's probably uh, safe to say that the vast majority of the wine produced in, in Chile is, is, uh, is red wine. Well, it kind of makes me wonder why everybody started hating Merlot back in 2004. Yeah. I mean, of course, if it tasted, if they thought Carmenere was Merlot. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's and what's crazy is that even the, the winemakers, you know, in the, and the scientists in the lab, they, they were just chugging along like, oh, this is Merlot, no big deal, um, which, is, which is pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. But um, this this cab is made by you know kind of one of the bigger more famous um, uh, wine producers in Chile. They make a, a whole range of of wine from kind of this uh, entry level cab all the way up to you know very uh, expensive um, uh, Bordeaux blends and single varietals. Um, and this has um, uh, I believe it's got about fifteen or twenty percent Merlot, so it's uh, more of a traditional kind of left bank Bordeaux blend, um, has a little bit of oak aging, but definitely um, I'd love to hear what you guys say, but this, this wine, the aroma of this wine is totally different from what we had in Argentina. We're in uh, definitely in a, in a kind of another realm of, of, of red wines.
um, <coughs> alcohol a little bit in the back of my throat. Um, Carlos, did you um, did you try this uh, this cab? Uh, no, I couldn't get this one. Yeah, I, so I, I just I I just typed a message right now, but I tried yeah. to get it from my rep. And, yeah, and they said Got that it. the Chardonnay was available, but the cab was no longer available, and they didn't have any on order. But yeah, I, I saw some. Yeah, I saw some remarks that they got it at Costco, but I'm, I'm assuming maybe it got moved to a, a Costco only item or they just bought it all, one of the two. Yeah, it could be, it could be. Um, this is um, where before the, the Malbec was more like uh, cherry, like black cherry, tart cherry. This to me is, has more of a strawberry, raspberry, but definitely I get um, like a little bit of a, kind of a tobacco-y, um, you know, kind of a, a aroma from, a little bit of that oak aging. It doesn't have a ton of oak influence, but it definitely on the, in the on the nose you can you can pick up a little more of uh, that classic French um, French oak. Um, let's see, they got ours. Oh wow, how about that? They got it from Wine.com, fast delivery. Okay, can we use Wine.com in in Alabama, Carlos? I don't think no, so. No, they won't. Yeah, they won't ship. Yeah, that I think that's called a felony. I believe uh, in, in, in Alabama. <laughs> um, oh, man. I just want to buy wine. I don't want to. Yeah, I just want to buy wine. That's right. Hey, here. I can't wait How to are change you? some more of our laws. Doing good, doing yeah. good. I, I, I was gonna say somebody. I haven't tried it. But somebody told me that you can have them ship to ABC store mm -hmm. and uh, pick up from there. Yeah, I've I've done that yeah. on a few occasions. I've I've had some wine. Uh, I'm in a uh, yeah. a wine me too, club. Recently. And they um, they have to ship it, or they don't have to. They they're happy to ship it to the ABC store, and uh, you can go pick it up and pay a small fee. It's usually less than a dollar. You pay the tax on it or whatever it is, and you walk yeah. out with your with your case of okay. wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This this cab is is very interesting. It's um uh, unlike a, say a big Napa cab. Uh, this is, uh, the tannins are much smoother and softer, uh, and, um, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of caramel. Um, but I'm, I'm really, uh, I was really expecting because it's 14 and a half percent alcohol. I was expecting it to be a much bigger wine. Um, but, uh, you definitely get the, the hit of the, uh, of the alcohol, but the tannins are, you know, relatively, um, you know, uh, you know, restrained, I guess. Uh, but it definitely could use a, a piece of uh, a, a piece of red meat, like a you know brisket or a big juicy hamburger or something. Yeah, I would like to add that uh, Montez makes a wine called Montez Alpha, the Purple Angel. Oh yeah, and it's oh yeah, ninety-two percent Carmenere, eight percent Cab. It's yeah, unbelievably good. It's yeah, it's such a good. It's not that expensive either. You'll pay a little bit more for it, but it's it's very it's very, it's well worth it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they may come. I mean, they just do some really, really uh, nice stuff. Um, um, anybody um, have any comments about uh, about this one? Let's see. Yeah, they oh, they picked up. That's right, the Montes Alpha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. we we have we have some comments. Hey, Suzanne. Hey, yeah. Um, the funny thing to me was when Scott first tasted this one, he said it's, it tasted like, it smells like wood. Yeah. I compared to the two before. <laughs> yeah. And then, he, and then he said, but in a good way. Yeah. And I was thinking that's the oak. I, I think, you know, the, the oak with the wood. That's but right. All three of these, and they are each different, but we're appreciating what's different about each one. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And Carlos, maybe you could speak to that a little bit because I think what, what Suzanne is talking about is, is um, it, it would be good to maybe expand on. And I, I mentioned it earlier, but just because of a wine is aged in oak doesn't mean that it's going to look and taste like bourbon um, because sometimes they'll use barrels that are second and third generation that are basically um, pretty neutral, right? I mean, it's not always adding a lot of pronounced flavor and a lot of um, tannins and, you know, all that oak influence. So uh, a good thing, a good little practice, which I do with like a lot of people that are other sommeliers and when we're evaluating wine, we always like to find our markers 
on uh, identifying certain things in wine. Um, we call it that, we call that the almond joy because yeah. especially with like new oak, like it literally smells like coconut, it smells like an almond joy with that chocolatey and nutty and, and, and coconut background. So do that one day, grab an almond joy, grab a wine that has at least, if, if it says it on the wine label or if you find it on, on wine notes on the internet, but if it says that it has at least 30% new oak or more, yeah. Put it, put it next to an Almond Joy, smell the Almond Joy and then smell the wine and see how, how, how crazy that they, <laughs> how, sim, how similar they are. And so it's really, yeah, yeah. yeah that light bulb kind of comes on. You're just like, whoa, like it's true. It, it does. It smells like a Almond Joy. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So is that just from the, the tropical influence of that oak? Yeah. Well, you know, with new oak, uh, there are a lot of, a lot of us when we're evaluating wine, we say that it smells like sweet and sour or smells like dill or smells like coconut. Coconut's the one that I usually get. Yeah. Coconut's the one where like, even like when I'm training people and I'm just like, you know, I mentioned the word coconut. They're like, that's it. That's it. Yeah. It's, it smells like coconut. And it does, or like coconut oil. But right. that's just, that's just the natural byproduct of, of the new oak influence that can affect the, affect the wine. And so, uh, so like, for instance, for this wine, um, which does have some oak, but they're older barrels, it's going to uh -huh. have less assertive oakiness, right? I mean, it's, right. it's not going to have, you, you'll get some of it, but not that over the top. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at it this way, you know, oak is porous. So whenever they age wine in, in oak barrels, it's going to have just a little, I mean, just the smallest amount of contact with oxygen and just yeah. enough oxygen to be able to allow the wine to mellow over time. So right. that really helps it from being less bitter and less astringent and yeah. makes it to what people would like call like a, a silkier or smoother wine. Right, so it smooths out the tannins. Right. Um, you know, it's, I guess we would call that the good oxidation as well as it kind of, you know, ages a little bit in the barrel as opposed yeah. to a completely sterile environment like stainless steel, which is completely inert. You know, it's no uh, influence of any, um, it's non-porous, so you don't get those same, you know, you get basically what we had with the, um, with that Amato Sur, which is a, uh, you know, fresh, bright, um, no complexity from any of that interaction from, uh, you know, the kind of the breathing of the barrel. Cool. Um, I do want to answer one of the questions that I just saw uh, across the bottom about pairing this wine with, uh, with a dessert. Um, I would now, okay, so I'm one of those people where, like, I don't turn people away from, you know, I, I, don't, I don't discourage people from drinking with what they're eating. If you want to have white wine with red meat, perfectly fine. Yeah. If you want to have red wine with white, white fish, perfectly fine. Just whatever you like, do it. But at the same time, there are some things that you're going to find that might be more enjoyable and not as enjoyable. Now, rule of thumb, uh, you don't want the food to be sweeter than the wine because it's going to make the wine taste bitter. So if you were to get like a really sweet piece of chocolate and put it against a Cabernet, you're going to notice that it's going to add a lot of bitterness to it. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that you can't have red wine with dessert, but it's better if you find something that doesn't have as much sugar or uh, as an alternative, uh, some uh, uh, cheeses uh, some yeah. that you, you know, for dessert would probably be a better, a better choice. Yeah, well, I'll tell you this, um, Carlos, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we um, um, had a, you know, we were sitting around having a, 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 a cab, a Chilean cab, and, um, didn't have anything for uh, dinner. And I went to the refrigerator and pulled out um, a bag of uh, Nestle's dark chocolate chips. And um, the dark chocolate chips and the cab were pretty dynamite. I must they look say. Really well together. Yeah. Oh man, Very cool. I'm telling you, it was, it was about as good cheap fun as I've had in a long time. Yeah, there's yeah. this chocolate um, I have it upstairs and it's a little pricey, but I buy it off of Amazon. It's probably like 20 bucks a box, mm -hmm. but it's from France and it's more of like a cocoa a chocolate, not like the sweet sugary chocolate. It's unbelievable. Next, I'll, Scott, I'll, I'll take a picture of it and I'll send it to you. Maybe next time when you do one of these, you can, you can, you know, show it, but it's, it has just the perfect amount, just the right amount of sweetness to go with red wine. And I mean, like yeah. I can just sit around and, Oh man, <laughs> I, 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 love all day. I yeah. love that. I love that. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Shelby, I appreciate um, 
your comment about whether or not you can serve key lime pie with Cabernet Sauvignon, um, I would echo what Carlos said. Uh, you can serve it uh, with anything you want. And um, uh, I would say uh, march forward. But the fact is, is like you said, if you have a wine, if you have a dessert that is sweeter than the wine, um, what, what it's gonna do is, the, is the, the sweetness, especially of something like key lime pie, that, um, that, that sweetness is gonna kind of steamroll any of the fruit that's in uh, the um, cab and you're just gonna get a lot of the, the bitterness and tannins. But um, don't, look, I, don't, don't, don't get flipped out. You know I mean, just go, go for it, have some fun. Um, or uh, have a little, uh, a little water back uh, while you're having the key lime pie and then, then get, then jump back on the, um, right. on the, uh, on the, uh, cab again. Um, okay. So Carlos, we're getting, um, a bunch of, uh, comments, folks wanting to know the name of this, of this fancy French chocolate that you're talking about. All right. Um, uh, let me see. I'll, I'll, I'll run upstairs. It's in my pantry. I'm, I'll run upstairs real quick and I'll go grab it. So okay. give, me, give me like, give me like, like a one minute. I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we're, uh, we're uh, at the, um, at eight o'clock anyway. Uh, so we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, getting toward the, uh, toward the, the final stages of the formal part of this. And I'll, I'll just say for, for those of you that are still on, um, thank you so much for being a part of tonight's tasting. Um, again, you can support the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, through Venmo at Jones is Thirsty. Um, in two weeks, we're doing a uh, cheese and wine pairing, uh, which can be a lot of fun. Uh, my guest is going to be a, a cheese maker, so we're going to talk about all of the cool, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, fun things that happen when you're pairing different cheeses with different wines. Uh, so you want to be sure to um, to uh, check that out. Um, for those of you who are in the Alabama region, um, the cheese maker is uh, Anna Kelly, uh, and she and her husband have uh, um, a day spring. Uh, cheese and uh, it's all sheep's milk cheese and they do some phenomenal stuff. Uh, one of my favorite cheeses is uh, uh, sheep's milk cheese that they do an aged cheese with uh, truffles in it, which is dynamite. And I'm hoping that she uh, um, talks about that. But uh, anyway, um, for, those of you, for those of you who can stick around, please stick around. Uh, for those of you who have to go, uh, have a wonderful evening again. Um, Thank you for being a part of uh, tonight's tasting. So, Carlos, were you able to fetch the chocolate? Okay. Yes. Cote d'Or? That's it right there. It's co Yeah, Cote d'Or, which translates to the Golden Slope. And yeah. so that's... Yeah, that's it right there. Does so that I say, get it off uh, of Amazon. Mignonette? So does it have... Uh, so I think of a mignonette as like what you have with oysters, of uh, like vinegar right. and... Yeah. But, but uh, that, okay. Right on. Yeah, so, so that's um, your uh, that's your that's your uh, your go to chocolate for uh, for cab, huh? God, this stuff's amazing. Like okay. it, it's not it, like it's there's not a single English word on here. It's completely in French. <laughs> so if you're trying to like read the calories and, and stuff like that, don't even bother. Like uh, you're not going to be able to listen, read it. Um, after a few glasses of cab and some chocolate, uh, if you're worried about calories, you're in the wrong gang at that point. Good. Good point. Good point. But you know, I did want to, you know, I did want to thank you for uh, doing South America because I, I didn't mention it earlier, but South America, I've got a strong, strong, strong passion for, uh, you know, because Chile, oh my God, the wines that they're making, I mean, just yeah. off the charts good. And you're paying a third of what you would pay for in Napa. And yeah. I actually, I attended a master class on Chile uh, probably sometime uh, about a year ago. And Jeff Kruth, who's a master sommelier, had just went to Chile and he brought back all these fantastic wines for us to try. And I mean, just talking about the area and he was in this place in, in Bio Bio where they had 100 year old vines. And like you said, Which it's untouched from Palacra. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, he said that he was in Bio Bio and they had just hectares and hectares of, of vines that were over a hundred years old grapes growing off of them. And he's like, so what are you guys doing with these? And they're like, nothing. There's just yeah. sitting, so there's That's vineyards nuts. just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. It's such a shame. And, 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 uh, but I mean, there's a reason why, you know, the Mouton Rothschild family and Quintessa and all of these really, really, really big names are going at Paul Hobbs, Donald Hess. Yeah. They're going to South America because uh, I mean, the land is dirt cheap. 
the quality of wine that you can that you can uh, make there is uh, like on par or above than what you're paying for a lot of you know five six hundred dollar bottles of wine um there's even like the uh, santa rita casa real yeah you know, that got a lot of press about 10 years ago when uh, some uh, french michelin star restaurant put it on their list and it was outselling Bhutan Rothschild, yeah. you know, like, which is like a, you know, on a restaurant list, like $2,000 a bottle. And, yeah. you know, Chile is where it's at. And I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going on record. I'll definitely say it, you know, repeat or don't repeat what I say, but Chile, I promise you five years from now, people are going to be chasing and, and just like tripping over themselves to buy Chilean wine. Yeah, that's great to know. And I think the other thing that I find uh, pretty interesting is um, a real um, a focus on organic farming there. And uh, also yeah. biodynamic farming. I mean, that's right, really this, right. this young generation of, of winemakers is really doubling down on sustainability. And um, I mean, it's just a lot of cool stuff going on there for sure. Yeah, they're also, they're changing a lot of their laws too. And they're uh, actually adding categories to, um, to the, uh, them as, and Argentina as well. You know, like in, in the United States, if it says reserve on the label, that means nothing. Like it means yeah, there, there's right. nothing mandating. There's, yeah, there's nothing mandating what, ha what needs to be put. Anybody could put, I mean, Franzia can make a reserve wine. It means nothing. <laughs> so, but if you go to Chile or you go to Argentina, if they put reserve on there, then it has to mean something. And yeah. same with like uh, Chile, they started doing Vigno wines. I don't know if you, yeah. I, I don't, Scott, have you, have you tried any of the- I uh, no. Uh -uh. Oh, they're amazing. So like in order for a producer to put Vigno on the label, like it has to be like dry farms, sustainable practices, has to be aged a certain amount of time, has to be handpicked, all grapes must be handpicked. Oh, wow. Like, there's so much, and, and they're not that expensive. So, you know, with the Vigno program, and then, you know, with them, you know, uh, uh, all the different laws that they're placing now, if they're really cracking down on what's going to be quality wine and what's not going to be quality wine. Um, which is like leaps and bounds ahead of the United States and even New Zealand and Australia and all these other places across the world for, that are, yeah. you know, in the, uh, you know, the Southern hemisphere. Yeah. So, well, not the United States, but um, yeah, it's just, they, uh, you know, they're, they're doing such great things over there. And, and I, I really urge people to drink more South American wines and do more than scratch the surface and really get in there. And uh, one more thing before I don't want to take up too much time, but screw cap wines, Scott, thank yeah. you. I'm a big fan. Like I love oh, yeah. top wines. Yeah, I'm saying it. And a lot of people get upset. Like when I'm in a room with them, and they're just like, "Yeah, screw top wine." No, yeah. I think I, I actually think that at least half of the wines produced in in the world need to go to screw top because um, it upsets me when you have a cork there and that cork is infected, and then you have to throw that bottle away or That's right. it just doesn't it doesn't taste right. So yeah, but yeah, you know what's big pretty interesting is um, uh, about that. And I was reading an article earlier this week about um, uh, TCA cork con con contamination and that um, the article was talking about how corks are getting better, but still you're talking about 2% to 8% of all the wine that's made in the world that uses cork is ruined because of TCA contamination um, even today. And so even with the yes. improvements that have been made to combat that, um, they're still, and again, for the way that we're drinking wine, we we talk about this in all these, these tastings, is that the vast majority of the wines that we're buying at the retail are meant to be enjoyed right now. So a screw top's fine. It's not like we're laying these down in the cellar for 20 years. I mean, it's, it's they're, they're, they're made to be enjoyed within a year or two of that of that the vintage date and so yeah the top is just fine even for red wines um yeah you know, white wines you see that more and more but even for red wines I'm, I'm i'm with you i i just think it's um you know it's it's so kind of silly a little bit to get um you know wrapped up in that you know look if, if i'm gonna if i'm if i'm buying bordeaux futures that's a different thing but if i'm just enjoying wines with my friends and, uh, you know, a screw top is just fine. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, it's, it's easier to open. You don't have to worry about the trichloranazole or the TCA that, you know, that yeah. can be infected. And the, the unfortunate thing is that uh, consumers, they buy wines with corks, they go home and they drink it, and they happen to have a corked or infected wine, and they don't yeah. know it. And so they, they just chalk it. it up as, 
this wine sucks. I'm never going to buy it again. But yeah. really, it's a very good wine and a good producer. It's just that that one bottle was affected by TCA. Yeah, but consumers that's... don't recognize that. And just if everybody, if you want to read up on it, just type in, uh, you know, like wine bottles TCA and read up on it. But um, if anybody's ever been to the YMCA or maybe like a, a, the gym or something <laughs> and you smell like what the, the, the pool area where the, with the yeah. chlorine and the mustiness, and that's what There's TCA smells like. Yeah. Yeah. It's how, like, how, oh, it's terrible. It smells, yeah. it smells like the YMCA, like after, you know, like after closing time, like it's, it's, it's so bad, but it, it does. That's my, that's oh, my marker. For Carlos. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. But no wonder why people don't like this stuff because you know, that's why yeah. I, I feel safer with, with, if I know the producer, like, like Jean-Luc Huguel, who spends yeah. the extra Euro to get uh, cork, sure. uh, corks that aren't affected by, or can be affected, but it yeah. sucks because it's like so many wines can be affected by this, but consumers, we just, you know, the, you know, don't really know what, how to identify TCA. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, that's like right. cardboard. Yeah, definitely. Like cardboard. That's a, that's a great yeah. one. And the other thing is yeah. too, is it once it gets, once it gets out, it can get into the walls. It can get into the, it can get into the cardboard, the boxes. I mean, if it's in the winery, it's, I mean, this stuff is anyway, yeah. it's, that's, a, that's, that's for, uh, that's for uh, wine <laughs> 210 or, or 201 yeah. or 301. But um, uh, okay, so uh, we'll open up the phone lines now. If uh, anyone wants to uh, uh, ask any other questions or if you have any comments about the wines we had tonight, um, I'd love to, uh, love to, love to hear. Uh, Shelby looks like she's got her hand raised. Uh, do you have another question, Shelby, about the key lime pie or <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's happening there in, uh, in, in Maryland? Well, we have our whole crew of people here and we really enjoyed listening to you and Carlos talk about the various things that we just heard. But way back, um, like this 10 is Grace ago, talking, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's, it's Grace. <laughs> I'm over here in the corner. Very um, good. But how do you go about collecting wines? Like when Carlos was saying, in five years, like people are all going to be talking about Chilean wines. Like it just, I mean, does it make sense to buy this wine now and hold on to it? What does it really mean to become a collector? And what you look for. Yeah. Yeah. Carlos. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I get that question a lot. And so the best way to answer that is get familiar with the producer that you trust and collect their wines. Um, you know, it's, it's a gamble. It is, it's a crapshoot. Yeah. I mean, like, I remember one time I, I got this bottle and the restaurant that I worked at, we were selling it for, I think it was five or $600 a bottle on the list. So the wholesale was probably about 150, $200 bottle of wine. It was a one vintage California, fantastic producer. You know, like I opened it uh, 10 years later, it was terrible, terrible. Then I went, you know, opened up one of my other bottles that was like 15, 20 years old. And it was amazing, which was the Gerga Chills. And so yeah. it, it's like it, learning producers now, not all wines, they say on the market, 95% of wines are to be consumed within one to three years, 95%. So that only leaves about like, you know, just 5% of wines that, that are uh, ageable. Uh, Scott, one of the wines that I was sipping on tonight, and I was going to show you <laughs> later. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. There you go. There's, there's your Santa Rita. Wow. Uh, 2011 oh, Carmen Air. Oh man, there's it your Carmen Air. And from a Palta. Best. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the best Carmen Air I've ever had in my life. Again? Carlos, can we see it again? Yeah, yeah, sure. We're all uh, gonna take a picture now. Yeah, we're gonna that's take a picture. Like, that's how we, that's how we uh, archive things. Oh, Come on, Kim, take a I picture. Don't have, I don't have my... <laughs> Hold on one second. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, over time. We, we have to go back and pin Carlos. Okay. okay, Carlos, you have to talk, so it puts you in speaker mode. Okay, so yeah, all right, hold it, hold it up again. Oh, now you have to hold it up okay. so they can see it. Ooh, excellent! Okay. Thanks. That's it's awesome. Amazing. All right, no, don't mute. Hold on, Carlos. So, or Carlos or Scott. Yeah, I, I feel like like ten years ago, I kind of got introduced to Malbec, and um, I feel like they went downhill. Uh, okay. So, whenever I first start drinking them. And do you, I mean, have you heard anything about that? Like someone told me multinational corporations have bought up the small, you know, uh, vineyards and then kind of, you know, mass produced and mixed them with maybe not as good of grapes. As before. Is that true? Or was I just imagining that I felt like the quality had gone downhill? 
I think there's a lot of truth to that. I really do. Uh, because I've, I've tried some wines from some solid producers that I've loved for a long time and then went back and gave them a shot. And I didn't think that they were as good as they used to be. Like um, Garcon they, was one, like Garcon. Uh, yeah. Not, for some reason. Yeah. That That's right. I really something like that. So also, uh, just to touch on real quick about the aging, um, the, uh, the Claude de los Siete, the one by Michel Roland, that thing will live forever. And I have actually, I have for sale at the shop that I, that I work at, I have some 2009 vintages that are singing right now. Like they're unbelievable. So 11 year old Malbec, Syrah, Cabernet blend, you know, uh, that, you know, Michel Roland makes. I'm, we're, we're just now on the 09s that I mean, they're amazing. So He's a good producer to go with. So anything pretty much Michelle Roland, I would go with. So uh, you recommend that we would buy more of this and we can hang on to it and it'll still taste as wonderful. It'll taste better. It'll I would, better. yeah, I would buy it by the palate. Okay. It's delicious. The one we have today, <laughs> I accept. The one we have today is a 2015 and it was delicious and it'll just get better as it ages. Okay. That was super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Good enough. Promise. I promise. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Call me 10 years from now. If, it's, if I'm wrong, then you can chew me out. <laughs> okay. Where do you live, Carlos? I'm in Alabama. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Scott and I are in Alabama. Yeah. Right. Hey, Jenny, it looks like you've got your hand raised. Do uh, you have a question or a comment? I don't want to, I don't want to. Yeah, I, I, I do have a question. Um, sorry. How are you I doing? I want to make sure. Yeah, good. How are you? Thanks for Great. my question. Yeah, so yeah. Basically, just curious. Um, it's kind of twofold. One, does Argentina have any rules or requirements, like say, like Bordeaux region, where you're not allowed to irrigate? And then, secondly, are they considering doing any sort of control? Because I know Mendoza is always the big one for Malbecs. Yeah. But are they considering doing any like particular sub-region controls, like some other areas have done pertaining to the wines? So, thank you. That's it. Yeah, oh, yeah, great, great job, by the way. Great. Well, thank fun. you. Great question, um, I, Carlos. I you can you can confirm that, but I don't. I've never. I haven't known Argentina to have any regulations against irrigation. Um, if anything, um, a lot of those super high elevation vineyards they want to irrigate where they, but they can't get really get a lot of water to them. But are you? Um, do you hear anything about regulations against irrigation there? No, actually, uh, Argentina is one of the only countries that absolutely have to rely on irrigation. So you're right, though. There are, there are countries that in, uh, in place laws where they cannot irrigate. But Argentina, uh, I mean, they, in Mendoza, like I said earlier, they average eight inches of rain a year. And if yeah. you go to San so Rafael. Super yeah, dry. Right. And then San Rafael and Mendoza, uh, they only have 30 days out of 365 days a year, they have 30 days of cloud cover. So you're only out of, you know, out of the whole year, you're gonna see 30 days of, of cloud cover. So they need irrigation. They're, they're, they don't get a lot of rain, so they have to live off of that, you know, like to, in order for them to grow wine. But um, now they do have a reserva and a ground reserva system, which mandates, you know, like how they need to be aged or how they need to be picked and, you know, how many, uh, you know, kilograms per, per hectare that need to be harvested. So they do have some, they do have some laws in place that are regulating a lot of the winemaking, but um, I don't see, I haven't really seen anything restricting what they're allowed to do. Yeah. So in terms of um, uh, like you would see in, um, in France where they have very strict rules about um, what grapes can be grown and put those grapes on the label. Um, no, Argentina doesn't seem to be leaning into that. Right. Can I, can I ask one more thing? Sorry. Of course you can ask yeah. all the questions you want. Um, <laughs> sorry. Is, uh, we've talked, we've focused on red wines tonight. Is there a, is there a white grape that grows well in this region as well? That's my last question. Thank you. I, I love the Tarantes, the, um, the white, uh, white, it's kind of a white grape of Argentina. That's great. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Chile makes some terrific uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but in terms of just trying something new, that Torontes, I think, is a really cool uh, white grape that is um, uh, very unique and kind of definitely unique to Argentina um, and um, is pretty widely available these days. So I, I would say uh, look for that. Carlos, what do you guys have in the shop? Uh, yeah, I carry a lot of Torontes. I love Torontes. Um, even the, like what you mentioned, Sauvignon Blanc. 
Um, Chardonnay from Chile, another really good uh, good one to go after, especially from the southern regions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, even some Chardonnay uh, from from uh, Argentina, definitely yeah. worth giving a visit. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. Thank you. Oh, uh, anyone else? We're uh, about 8.30, so I uh, don't want to um, keep everyone too long, but definitely want to give you guys a chance to ask uh, any questions um, or have any uh, reflections or comments about the stuff we've had tonight. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for the big thumbs up. Appreciate the good thoughts. Um, well, Carlos, I do want to say, and I want to give everyone else a chance to say thank you very much. Um, and if thank you guys want to unmute, unmute yourselves and uh, give Carlos a, a, a warm round of applause, make him feel welcome. Thank, thank you, you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Done, Carlos. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Scott, thank you, man. I, I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, it sure beats doing happy hour with my friends on Zoom. And <laughs> now I actually get to talk about wine instead of talk about what they, uh, had to witness in their restaurants. So yeah. <laughs> this is cool. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, well, no, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Uh, Dana said um, she enjoyed the wines more than she expected. Uh, cool. She doesn't typically uh, buy South American reds. Um, and she said, uh, thank you both. So Carlos, uh, yeah. good stuff, man. I appreciate you, uh, you being along. And uh, again, for those of you who are, um, in the Birmingham area. Carlos is in Pelham at uh, Pleasure is All Wine. Run over there and, uh, and check them out. And also, I can't uh, let you leave, Carlos, without uh, getting you to talk a little bit about the uh, Insta Instagram Live uh, uh, kind of wine tastings that you guys do on, uh, uh, or on Facebook or Instagram Live. I feel like I, it all yeah. runs together, but you guys, regularly do um, these um, short uh, little uh, vignettes around uh, wines in the shop, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you go on our um, uh, Facebook page or Instagram and look at the videos that we've been doing, uh, we've been doing them every week and they're pretty much just wine education. Uh, we have a lot of fun with them, but we'll taste the wines or even beers. We're, we're, we've been doing beers lately too. That's right. And yeah, so you'll get to see firsthand like what we have to say about the wines and, you know, evaluate them. And it's a lot of fun. Like we, it's not too stuffy and serious. It's like we just kind of relax and just kind of go with it. And, you know, uh, we're all friends on there. So we, uh, we have a good time with it. Yeah. So pleasure is all wine. Uh, like it on Facebook or Instagram and, and check it out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Carlos, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, yeah. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for uh, being part of tonight's event. And um, hope you all have a, a safe night and a uh, uh, wonderful rest of your weekend. And uh, hopefully we'll see many of you back in two weeks for our uh, wine and cheese pairing uh, uh, event. So um, cheers to everyone. And... Um, See you guys soon. Thanks so much. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.